So, hello. Um, before we start, I'm Rachel Neighbors, and I'm curious to know how many of you are designers? Raise your hands. Okay. How many of you then are developers? What the hell are you doing in here? <laughs> okay, well, I'll try to give you some tips for how to, how to train designers as well. So, I used to be a cartoonist before I got into front-end development, and it's a long story and another talk, but needless to say, I used to make comics, and you can still find them at rachelthegreat.com. They're for teenage girls, though, so I'm not sure how interesting they'll be to this crowd. And I ended up, when I came into web development, it was uh, as a web designer, of course, because illustration kind of actually bleeds over into that nicely. I really enjoyed CSS and JavaScript to an extent that it allowed me to manipulate things and do more CSS. But I had a problem because while I was really good at figuring out CSS, page layouts, etc., even like uh, how to use HTML elements, it was really hard for me to wrap my head around JavaScript. And I picked up all the books that the JavaScript developers told me to pick up. I, I read all the articles and I, I banged my head against the wall trying to figure it out. But it never clicked, and I thought, well, I must just be stupid because I'm not getting it. But it turned out, actually, that the problem wasn't me. I had an ability to learn just like everybody else in this room does. The problem was that all those materials were written by developers for developers. They expected you to have experience with two or three other languages, and every metaphor in the book compared something in JavaScript to something in another language, like classes. You know, I don't know what a class is, at least I didn't. I didn't know what a class was until I started looking at Ruby. So this means that there's a very high barrier to entry for designers, because before we can even pick up a book on JavaScript, we first have to go learn a couple other languages first, requiring us not only to know everything about design, but to know everything about development as well, essentially being two jobs in one. So if you're here, it might be because you use JavaScript or jQuery on a daily basis, and it's working. You follow the tutorials. You copy and paste your plugins. But sometimes you see some spooky behavior. So you're using these tools without thoroughly understanding them. You'd like to know more about that. Like, why is this break every morning? Or maybe it's because you want to talk more with your developers and actually understand what they're, they're saying when they use words like methods and recursion. Some of these concepts are pretty hard to wrap your head around if you've never taken a computer science course. Or maybe you're here because you have imposter syndrome and you feel like it's just a matter of time before they all find out that you're faking it and they're going to boot you out of the club. Or maybe you're here because you really want to learn JavaScript and get good at it. I mean, it's empowering. I mean, once you know how to use JavaScript, you're no longer at the mercy of other people and what they can build. You can start talking about what you want to build. You know what's possible. You, you have a better understanding. You have the vocabulary, the tools with which to join the conversation, start building the web. And you get respect for that. And of course, because you are now two jobs in one, you are a unicorn. And unicorns do all the things, and they get paid 20% more. So anyway, today I wanted to cover a lot more than we actually are going to get to cover. So at the end of this, there's a special cap slide. If you go past it, there's a couple of topics we didn't get to cover, just in case you're having trouble stomaching some of the things you hear today, a little glossary of terms that might be useful. Today we're just going to cover some things like vanilla JavaScript, ECMAScript, jQuery, how they're all related, objects, functions, the document object model, and event listeners. Pretty simple stuff, but core to understanding JavaScript and not just jQuery. So let's get started. First of all, ECMAScript is JavaScript. ECMAScript is just the standard by which JavaScript is written. You might be familiar with the standards written for CSS and HTML. JavaScript has one of those, too. ECMA stands for the European Computer Manufacturers Association. That's the body that sets the standard. Currently, most books are written, most of the books you're probably reading trying to learn JavaScript are written with version 3 in mind. But version 5 is well supported, and 6 is on its way later this year. Now, jQuery is just written in JavaScript. It's not a special language. It's just a library. There are lots of libraries out there that do all kinds of things. jQuery is just one of them. Here are a couple of really cool ones. I'm a big fan of impact.js because it's a, it's a uh, HTML5 games engine. It's really cool. And that's the sort of thing I usually spend my days working with. 
I like to fool around with lots of illustration and interactive bits. So that's my day job, and that's where I come from, from JavaScript. And that's actually how I got into learning JavaScript better than I did before. I got some really exciting projects. Now, if you've heard the term vanilla JavaScript thrown around, and I've actually had some people ask me when I say vanilla JavaScript, what library is that? It's not a library. Vanilla JavaScript is just like a secret password. Um, basically, it's just JavaScript. It's a special word so that when people look at your resume, they know you don't mean you understand only jQuery, but you're putting it down as JavaScript. This is a way of saying to people, I understand JavaScript. So for instance, this here is just a jQuery selector, but in vanilla JavaScript, uh, document dot query selector all, P will do the same thing. All, thank you. All right, so I can see you right now, but who out there knows that JavaScript isn't Java? Yay, I'm so glad I don't have to spend time on this. Yeah, Java, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, Java is a back-end coding language. So let's talk about those objects. You might have heard that everything in JavaScript is an object. What's an object? Well, I don't know, but they're key to understanding JavaScript, period. By the way, Cody Lindley right there, he wrote my favorite book on JavaScript ever, JavaScript Enlightenment. If you're having trouble grasping some of the concepts today, go pick up that book. It's excellent. Great primer. Doesn't assume any knowledge of any prior uh, programming experience. So let's talk about what a job, uh, an object looks like. When I first saw this picture right here, well, this isn't a picture. This is actually a table. I think I threw the book across the room and said, those developers have been holding out on me. That's just a table. Objects are just collections of things, and we call them properties. They're key value pairs. Here we've got a property for name, and its value is Twilight Sparkle. Same for colors, wings, etc. It even has a function, which we'll get into those a little bit later, called getName. We call those methods. And this object is a unicorn, obviously. So here's what we do to make that object using JavaScript. And I'm just curious. How many of you use the console on a daily basis? Raise your hands. OK, that's good. But for those of you who don't, we're going to play with it, because I love the console. This was one of those things that every developer uses it, but no designer ever has the time to sit down and use it, but it's so helpful for understanding things. Here, we're making this unicorn. And there she is. This is what that object looks like. She's got her color. She's got her function. She's got her name. And you see this thing, this little shadowy object down here? We're not going to go into that today, but this is the, the prototype. And when we talk about prototyp, prototypal, prototypal, prototypical, I'm not sure how you say it. I've heard it said a bajillion different ways. When we talk about prototypal inheritance, it's this thing right here. It's kind of like a, how do you put this? It's, a, um, it's like a genetic blueprint for objects. It tells them where they came from and where they're going. They pass them on when you build other objects from objects. So that expression we just used is called an object literal. And there are other ways to make objects, but this is the preferred way. So those things that we are making, the names, et cetera, those are, those are stored as variables. Oh, sorry. Pardon me. You can store objects as variables. For instance, bar unicorn. We're just going to overwrite the unicorn object here. Now when we ask what unicorn is, it's an empty object. We've declared it, though, using this var keyword. It's a good idea to do that. Now, there are many types of objects. There's an important distinction amongst them. Some are complex, and some are not so complex. We call them primitive. Complex objects contain complex information. You just saw an example of an object that was filled with different properties. You can also make forays, which are kind of like, like lists. They're a lot of fun. Hang on. Too many things in my hand. I like lists. So then we go, and there's your list. It's just basically a list of strings here, but you could make lists of other things. And then there's functions, which do things. And we'll talk about them in another section. So all those. All of those objects are complex because they contain lots of complicated data, and it's hard to say what they're worth. It's hard to evaluate them. Whereas with primitive values, they just represent a value. For instance, 
a line of string. I mean, it's just string. That's fairly simple, right? It's not going to be a string and something else and a function. And you've got Boolean values, which evaluate as true or false. And the fun part is, if you want to know what kind of object something is, you do type of. No, that's a different object. And it will tell you right there that the sword is Boolean. Handy trick. And number, of course. So all of those are fairly primitive, fairly simple. The difficulties come into comparing those objects. When you want to comp compare complex objects, uh, it gets very, very interesting. Here we've got two arrays. They've got equal amounts of, uh, they've got an equal number of objects in them. So you think, you know, two arrays with two things, they should be equal, right? But not so. Let's see what happens when we compare them. Well, it says false. It's because castles aren't the same thing as pegasi. You can't compare castles to pegasi. However, if we reassign these with numeric values, and we do the same comparison, they evaluate true, because a 2 is a 2 is a 2 is a 2. Now, why we're using the triple equals operator there is a story for another day. But if you want to learn more, there's an excellent link on the slides. I hope you'll visit them after the show. Now, this is my favorite object of all, and it's one that I think we don't talk about enough when we're training designers in JavaScript. The global object. It's the god of objects. Every time you open a window, there's a global object sitting there, and it contains the, the window object and the document object, and it contains your history API. Uh, wait, wait. It contains your history as well, which you can interact with the history API. It's got all these great things in it. It's this, this gigantic bucket of objects and variables and everything you need to operate on that page. And you might have heard it thrown around, and it was confusing for me. People would say, oh, you know, make sure you put your var in front of your variables and put them in a function so they don't interfere with the global object. It was always this nebulous concept, this global object somewhere out there. It's like the god of objects. Every time you have a window open, there's a global object there happily encompassing everything you do. It's really cool. So yes, let me make sure I just touched on all that. Oh yeah, it's also called the head object or the host object, which gets really confusing, which is why I think of it as a big flying head demigoddess. And it's also inferred. We often refer to it in the browser using window. Uh, so window alert, hang on a minute. I'd love to do this demo. Nope. Window alert, well, come here. That's what happens when it works. It's the same as just doing simply alert. Because God is all-knowing, or at least the God of browsers is all-knowing, you don't need to say her name. She knows you're talking to her. All right, so objects at work. You probably use objects with jQuery all the time, and you're just not aware of it. For instance, making Ajax calls. Did you realize that this thing right here is an object? Those are key value pairs. You're passing them to something. And another thing, even though you guys know I'm a CSS person, so I would never, ever, ever recommend that you use CSS in jQuery to change the CSS on a page. But we've all fiddled around with it when we were learning jQuery, admit it. It's OK. There's no judgment here. So anyway, let's have a look at how we could simplify some things by using more objects in our jQuery. Here we've got two things that change the CSS in the same way. This is essentially the same CSS object being passed here. Well, it's actually not a named fob object, but it's got CSS in it. And we're using it in a function and in a method. Let's see if I can do this. So yeah, basically, it applies to the button when we click it, and it applies on runtime to the marks. 
So what we would do to simplify this would be to make a new object. I'm going to call it new style for lack of inventive thinking this morning. And then we copy the contents here. Put them in now. And style. So handy. Look at how we are saving so much space. Ta-da. And it works. So there you go. That's just a, a really simple, very contrived way of doing things. I uh, don't think you'll have to do anything quite like that, but maybe when you're working on Ajax calls, you will. By the way, in case you're not familiar with the term, when you hear people talk about DRY, dry development, it stands for don't repeat yourself. Basically, what we just did there by making sure that we weren't repeating that one particular object, that's that's in the dry, the don't repeat yourself method of thinking. Now, that's just uh, in case you want to look at the slides later. All right, let's go move on to functions. They're the mover and shakers of the JavaScript environment. Aw, oh, I never got to making that illustration last night. Oh, well. So functions are what we call first class objects. That means that you can construct them on the fly, you can pass them as parameters, you can return them from operations, and you can assign them to variables. We've already done some variable assignments, so you know how that works. Now, methods are when a, an object has a property that is a function. Here, getName in our unicorn object is a method. We say that getName is a method of the unicorn. In fact, I'll even show you a method in action. For fun, geez. That lets us, the parentheses actually let us run the function. Without the parentheses, you're just looking at it. So there are two ways to make a function. One is a function statement, and the other is a function expression. For the majority of this, we're going to be using function expressions because, well, they're more comfortable. I'm sure there's a good reason, but I don't know what it is yet. Feel free to send me an email and correct me about it later. So functions do stuff. They are kind of like the verbs of JavaScript. They can construct objects, they can return a value, or they can just run code. In this case, document, query, selector, all, p, it's like a, it's like a, a sentence saying subject, verb, object. Document, queries all the p's. I went to the grocery store, picked up milk. Also, we never run this one, so I'm going to run it now, just to show you how all the cool stuff it returns. It returns every P on the page. So much fun. So when I mentioned the uh, parentheses back there, when you use the parentheses, it's called invoking a function. It's basically telling, telling it to go do its thing. Anything you put inside those parentheses are arguments. You pass them to the function so it can use them. A little demo time. And this should return five. Yep, because we were passing those arguments to the function when it was invoked. And special case here, return lets you return a value from a function. Really handy when you're, you're making objects or doing things called closures. But after return, nothing else runs. For instance, here, we're gonna make a little red hen. And let's, uh, let's see, I'm gonna make a chicken. My first chicken was named Henrietta. She was a sweetie. She ran in. Oh, you see, she's laying eggs and she's pooping, but uh, she's not plotting against the humans. It never got to run that part. Although I'm pretty sure she was. 
Oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm going to skip this one. Cool illustration. Anonymous functions, they're like disposable functions. They, they don't have names. You use them once. You can't call them again because you didn't give it a name. But that can be really handy if you only need to do things once or twice and you don't want to litter your, litter your code with a bunch of declared function objects. Basically, right here, when it, you would click rebel or rebel, uh, it would console log the new world order has begun. This function right here that we're passing to click, that's an anonymous function. Super useful. That's also an example of a callback. A callback is when you pass a function to another function to be executed at a later time. We use it all the time when we use click. But we also use it when we're doing things like set timeout. I mean, up here with click, the function will run after the click event has been fired. And with set timeout, the callback runs about three seconds after. So let's see. There it goes. So functions that take functions as an argument are called higher order functions, or that return functions. So if you hear higher order function tossed around, just think back to callbacks. It's not to say they are callbacks, but the callbacks are a working example of a higher order function in action. So making objects with functions, this is super fun. Ooh, making good time. Constructor functions. Useful if you need to make numerous objects that are the same kind of thing. I actually don't do a whole lot of this in production, um, but I will be doing more and more of it as I make more and more games. So this is theoretical. I'm sure you don't actually need to make a bunch of unicorn objects, but in case you ever should, let's see how that would be done. I need some extra space. So what's going on here? We use the, a, we declare a capitalized unicorn uh, variable here. The capitalized u lets us know that this is a constructor. And the function that it's got takes several arguments that you can pass to it to set its constructed object. Um, down here, we've got Twilight Sparkle, which I'm going to do a demo for you. Actually, let's do rarity, because we've done, we've done Twilight Sparkle already. Bar rarity equal new. We use the keyword new to let us know that we're making a new one. New unicorn name. Color false. She doesn't have any wings. Oh, there we go. That's rarity. And she can even say hello. If I can remember the parentheses. There we go. That works. I'm curious, how many people here actually watch My Little Ponies? You guys are my best buds. Come by. I'll give you free mini comics. For the rest of you, you should be watching it. It's very funny. How many of you watched Animaniacs? Yes, you should be watching it. It's from the same teams. There's so much there. Oh, anyway, so scoping variables. Variables declared in functions are accessible only from within the function. That is to say, the global object can't reach in there and tackle them. It's your private thoughts, you know? You're in the privacy of your own bathroom. The global object isn't there with you thinking. At least you hope not. <laughs> Probably not the best example, but I'd like to think that what you state out loud isn't, isn't perceived by the universe. So anyway, let's give a little example. Here's a cat. We're kind of declare, we are declaring this in the global space. There's a global cat here. This is in the global object. It's an adorable pet that purrs cutely, right? And then we've got this function, Animalpedia, which has an, a different opinion of kitty cats. It says that they are a menace to birds, right? And it declares the bar of cat inside itself. So 
we know that when we call Animalpedia, it's going to tell us what it thinks and not what everyone else thinks. It says it's a menace to birds, but check this out. It did not overwrite the global cat. The global cat is still in existence. This would have been very different if we had not declared it inside. If you don't declare your variables, they immediately belong to the global, whoa. Oh, well, that didn't work right. Never mind. Moving on. <laughs> so, when you make a function, uh, this is born. I love this, even though it is vexing and confusing quite often. But it's not, if you understand that this is like a variable, and it refers to the context in which your method is being called. Context, not necessarily the function, but the context, i.e. the object within it's being run. So here we've got a lovely our object. It's going, we're going to display some spooky behavior here. We are making a lovely object, and we're giving it a function which lets us know what this is. So our object, what is this? Call your func. Oh, it's being a troublesome, troublesome lot. Yeah. You should totally be logging. Oh, yeah, that is actually what this is. I'm sorry, it looks weird, but it, that is what this is. It's the object that contains it. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about this in the global object. So by default, this belongs to the global object. If you just call this on a page, it's going to return your window, right? because everything belongs to your global object unless otherwise mentioned or designed. It can lead to some interesting misunderstandings because let's say we call, we make a new function out of the method inside our old function. I mean, our old object. And then we call new func here in our global space. What do you think it's going to return? It's returning the global object. So, functions, using them with jQuery. Now, we use functions all the time. And there's a fun thing about jQuery. I never really understood for many years what the dollar sign was. This is partly because there's no official training for designers on what jQuery is so much as how you use it, which can be very dangerous and frustrating for designers, I can assure you. So I'm here to let you in on the secret that dollar sign is just a, just a shortcut for jQuery. So dollar sign ID hide is the same as jQuery ID hide. Does this syntax look familiar to you from all the fun things we've been doing? Doesn't this look a little bit like a function? Well, that's because it is. jQuery is a gigantic function. Uh, it's got many methods. When you use it up here, what this is actually doing with jQuery ID, it's going out, jQuery is going out, it's scouring your document for ID, it returns it as a jQuery object, and then it runs its method hide on it. So there's a, a lot of wrapping going on there. There are a couple of talks going on today about wrapping. When you check them out, just think about how jQuery wraps things too. Now, about using functions, with jQuery. We use, we use them all the time, especially these anonymous functions. As you can see, in these two functions, we're doing kind of the same thing. We'll have a button that when we click it, it, uh, it alerts with what the button says, and we have one where when we hover, it alerts with but what the button says. Once again, terribly contrived, but we'll make a point. So works, works. Also, stop that. Stop it. There you go. All right, so let's make this a little more dry. So these are the same, essentially, right? We are going to actually hang on. I'm going to just, because I love copying and pasting so much. Var. What do I call this? Texty. Equal. 
There we go. Made a new function, stored it in a variable. Gonna pass that variable to the click and hover as callbacks. And this should still work. Or not. Oh yes, that's right. I intended to put a Y there. Did not happen. And it totally works. And I'm not hovering because that was terrible. So anyway. All right. We are all the way at the DOM API, and I've got nine minutes. It's good. That's very good. Everything is going exactly to plan. So the DOM. We talk about the DOM. We throw these words around a lot, but what is it actually? It is an application programming interface. There are actually many kinds of APIs out there. They're basically sets of rules and protocols that different programs use to talk to each other. I like to think of them as airlocks between space stations or biodomes. They're like these set of protocols that two environments use to make sure that they interact with each other without like harming each other. It's how you pass information and data to one another. There are a bunch of APIs available. There's some in your browser right now, including my favorite, the Web Audio API. Cannot get into Internet Explorer fast enough. And Canvas API, which is kind of cool, but I prefer CSS animations. And there are others. You know, you've heard of Twitter's API. Sometimes actual manufacturers and programmers make them available uh, so that you can interact with their systems through, through an API and mess with their data. But there is an API that you interact with every time you're using jQuery. It is in your window right now. It's the document object model. When you have a page, every element in your HTML tree, and let me show you an HTML tree, actually. Yes. Oh, this is not the best page to show you an HTML tree on. An HTML tree. It's basically, here we've got HTML document. It's got a body, it's got a section. You've seen this before. I know you have because you work with CSS every day. You know how to climb all over this tree. You're good at it. There we go. Basically, every one of those little, every one of those elements is, has a corresponding object available to JavaScript that's called a node. We did a lot of looking at JavaScript, uh, JavaScript's objects. So all you need to know is that how JavaScript is interacting with all this HTML is it's interacting with those nodes using this document object model. jQuery is special because it provided, at a time when there were no normalized methods for interacting with these things, cross browser compatible ways for going in, removing and inserting and messing around with the things that were on the page. That was a pretty big deal back when browsers couldn't get their shit together. Now you don't necessarily, now browsers are all, you know, on board with the ECMAScript standard and you can trust them. We use jQuery for doing fancier things and it's less of a big deal, but it's still awesome. So the global object and the document. In the browser, our global object is a window, right? And it contains the document object model, it contains history, it contains everything. It also contains a document node, and that is basically your HTML page. Pretty nifty. So when we were using that query for the P tag, and we used document query selector all P, that's what document was. That was the node in the global object. So fun. So I had to talk about the DOM so I could talk to you about events and their listeners because events and their listeners are very documenty things, even though they kind of sound like they're out there in the ether. Events, they can be triggered by users, the browser, or JavaScript itself. As with the set timeout, that was a JavaScript set event. But the click is a user event, right? Now, when I think of event listeners, you guys have heard about the internet. Uh, you guys have heard on the internet, I'm sure, about the kerfuffle with the uh, government listening in on what you're saying, right? Yeah. I like to think of them as uh, event listeners, as men in black listening to the document object. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was a click. There was a click on an A tag down there. Yeah, you, you, should, you should fire something right now. 
or no, 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 don't send them to the next page. You're sending a crew to take care of that right now. Cue the light box. So that's how I think of my event listeners. Yeah, basically, document, you, you actually use one every time you run JavaScript, I mean jQuery, most likely, with this document ready function. It's a, ready is actually just a jQuery method. And it's, in this case, an anonymous function callback runs when the DOM has been, men, uh, has been rendered. So you use this every day. You're listening for events. Now, what happens with events is that they bubble up through the DOM. They, they trigger different listeners on their way. And this is very useful because there's a problem with event listeners. Oh, and also, if you don't want that to happen, as the case with the uh, light box, you can use jQuery's handy event prevent default to stop that propagation from letting the event uh, hurt anything else on the page or take people away. Page rendering event listeners. Basically, events should be attached immediately after the DOM is rendered. Here we attach uh, the click handler after document ready. As you can see, this is, uh, all those LIs should now have a listener on them. This becomes a problem if you try to add do uh, DOM nodes after the page has been rendered and all those listeners have been added. For instance, here, when you click on the list items, they fire off this little alert. It's lovely, right? When you add a list item, nothing happens, right? It's not so cool. Let's see. But there's something we can do. The solution is to listen from higher up in the document object model. And we can do this using jQuery's very own on. What this will do is we're basically doing a phone tap on the document object model. So instead of using a, so instead of adding this click function to every single li as the page is loaded, what we're going to do is make our own function. Hang on. And now, all the people entering are frightening me. And I'm being unnerved. <sighs> Calm down, Rachel. You can do it. Anyway, I'm sorry, it's not going to work out. I'm losing my nerve here. So what you need to know is the syntax here. Basically, all you need to keep an eye on is the syntax. What we're doing is we're taking that UL, the container UL, and we are assigning an event listener to it, saying, hey, event listener, stick to this UL. Listen for any clicks that come from LI, and then fire click on LI when you hear that. And that should work quite nicely in a non-talk environment. So basically, the point here that I'm trying to make is that JavaScript really isn't that scary. It only seems scary because a lot of the materials out there weren't written for you. There are good materials out there that are written for designers and can be understood. Not 100% not easy to find. So at the end of my talk, I do have a slide with a bunch of really cool links that you should check out. I hope that you have enjoyed meeting your new best friends, event listeners, objects, and functions. They are your best friends forever. Get to know them, love them. Everyone is afraid of the global object, but I encourage you to embrace it and discover all the wonderful things it can do. Like I said, there are links, there are books, there are places to dive in. And I'd like to thank everyone for all their attention today. Special thanks to my technical reviewers, Scott Gonzalez, uh, Rebecca Murphy, and Adrian uh, sorry for my thanks to everyone for technically reviewing my, my slides. So, and also, if you want to check these out later, there is a really cool glossary of neat stuff that we didn't get to cover. I'm done. You can clap now.